The most productive mine in Britain today is called Riddings Drift. This is where the mine was born, in a colliery manager's house. Two years ago, the planning started. A bold plan to sink a mine straight into the coal to combine the best of British know-how with the best of American techniques and to achieve results fast. Charles Round brought to bear his international mining experience. Trevor Massey was to manage the operation. By 1969, there was something to show on the surface. This is where the coal will be stacked for shipment. From here, men will ride to the mouth of the drift, an incline rather than a shaft. It's quicker that way. Underground equipment began to be assembled. And down the embryo slope, men began to travel, to tunnel straight into coal, and start forming the underground roadway. Trevor Massey talks of the men who did the job. For a manpower, this is undoubtedly the greatest, greatest asset of Riggins. Uh, with approximately 60% of our men have in fact been um, transferred from uh, two colonies which had closed. They were experienced miners, but with little practice in the new techniques they were to apply. From underground at Riddings, coal started to roll out straight away even before the shape of the mine was established. Side by side with making a mine and winning coal in the process, the men had to be taught the new machine skills they... Me. Training is a very important aspect of reading. We need to have men who are adaptable to different jobs. This involves moving men round in different jobs, which they willingly do, and in fact they move themselves round in order to become experienced at the different uh, jobs in any particular part of the pit. They didn't only move around the pit though, they moved around the country. This group of Riddings men are in Cheltenham at the works of the manufacturers who will produce for them the means to support those coal faces still some months in the future. During the winter of 69 and 70, Riddings men learned on the surface all the ins and outs of the equipment they'd be operating over the years to come. When I was given the job as production engineer in charge of Riddings Drift Mine just over two years ago, I never thought it would reach the fantastic achievement it has done. My DDM said to me, John, this mine will be a 10 ton a man ship mine. I thought, well, 10 ton appears to be a lot. If we get 8 ton, at least, which we've got somewhere. There's one thing that the miners will accept, and that's a challenge. John Williams says the achievement was fantastic. And he was right. They were aiming at 10 tons a man a ship, when the British national average is nearer two and a half tons. That doesn't mean that the rest of Britain's miners are slacking. Far from it. Few other pits enjoy the planning from ground downwards that has gone into this mine. Well, initially, um, I think we were all impressed by the size of the objective. Uh, 10 tonne a man sounded pretty fantastic. And 10 tonnes a man it was, very soon after the coal began to come out in earnest. But even better was yet to come, as day by day, the 160-man team rode the train in and out of the mines, the records began to tumble. First the British, then the European. Why at Riddings should this have proved the case? One reason is because they were starting from scratch. The coal was there and it was to be won the way some of the best brains in mining know how. Charles Round reinforces international exchange of expertise. Riddings we believe to be the first practical example of the successful integration of American and British experiences. So the roadways were driven, like in an American mine, straight and low, no waist height. And they used American machines to do it. 
They drove their roads in coal. Forget about taking out stone. And between the roads, they formed their main panels of coal for extraction. The machines that drove the roads doubled as cranes to lift the steel beams to support the roof. Once the faces were established, they were worked on the retreat, working from the limit backwards, with ever-shortening supply lines. Here, British machines took over. The stream of coal became a flood. Ubiquitous TV cameras made their appearance underground to monitor progress and to report to the surface control room where decisions can be made fast to match the speed at which the whole mine is producing. We talked of 10 tons a man shift at Riddings. That's all in the past now. They've hit 15. Today, they're on 17 and a half tons. And that's from every one of those 160 men on shift round the clock. It called for a celebration. So combine it with an official opening. Now everything at Riddings is running as it was planned. In August 1970, Lord Robins pulled up outside the house where it all started. Then underground with Trevor Massey to see for himself. As chairman of the coal board, he must have visited hundreds of our mines. But never before one laid out just the way Riddings is. So, for the boss, and for the men on the faces, who didn't interrupt production to stand on ceremony, there was plenty to discuss. How they're achieving these figures, their experience of the equipment and the techniques, how men feel about belonging to an international record-breaking team. Of course, it can't be done everywhere in Britain, because so many of our collieries still have to contend with their inheritance of the greedy past. But the men at Riddings have wiped the slate clean. They are starting with a new beginning and a new promise. So it was appropriate that the occasion should be marked by a get-together for all of them and their families, by a lunch, by music, and by speeches. They were down-to-earth speeches, speeches about the future. And there was the unveiling of a tangible record of Riddings progress. And tangible tokens to the men who had made it possible. The traditional, simple, yet essential safety lamp, which mining the world over has made one of its most potent symbols. Trevor Massey is entitled to have the last word. We have a saying at Riddings, which is, uh, we always stick to, it's a little ambiguous, but the saying is that tomorrow never comes. And this is not that we are in any way not planning for tomorrow or not preparing for it, but the point is that we can leave nothing for tomorrow that can be handled today. The pit moves at such a rate and at such speed that we must settle all our problems today, we can't leave anything until tomorrow. And it's with that aspect, that thought in mind, that we approach the future, confident now that we can do even better than what we've done in the past.